Says, get that India, big boy. Mike Asimo! Call an ambulance! Maybe call a priest! Oh, what a shot! What a shot! Campbell Killer! Hello and welcome back to a special edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020. Uh, joining me for... Uh, a topic that's pretty close to our hearts, I've got to say, 60s. Obviously, is my good mate here, 60s. Already sort of explored that one there. Uh, but, yeah, really fired up about this chat we're having today, uh, bringing back perhaps the most beloved guest of the show in the history, in it, well, in its entire history. Yeah, we're really pleased to be able to speak to Joey Grimer in this special edition of the Tip Sheet. As people know, we've got our three regular podcasts that happen each week with the um, news podcast, the preview podcast, the instant reaction. But we do have these special episodes where we get the opportunity to get people inside the game or to introduce them to uh, people who are involved in the game or people who love the game. So it's we're a little bit, sometimes a little bit outside of the Parramatta box. And that's the case here because we're really going to be talking about something that's critical to the PNG bid to be the next franchise accepted into the NRL. And before we get to our chat with Joey 60s, as always, just a quick little shout out to the sponsors of the tip sheet, Big Swing Golf, North Mead and Star Partners, Real Estate, Auburn, Rowan and Parramatta. Uh, whether it's a chance to do some virtual golfing or some property management stuff, they're your guys and they're our guys here at TCT. And without any more preamble 60s, I'll throw it to you to let us go talk to Joey. Well, I'm really pleased about this right now because we're catching up with a tremendous mate of the Cumberland Throw. We had lots of conversations and interviews with Joey Grimer in the past. We caught up with him at Saturday at Parramatta Junior Reps. We're really pleased to catch up with him here now. Joey, welcome back to the Tip Sheet podcast. G'day, 60s, and g'day, Jono. It is... So overwhelming to be here um, and to catch up with you guys on Saturday at Granville Park uh, was fantastic. And I'm just so honoured to be back on to your podcast and really excited about uh, some of the things that are evolving over here in uh, PNG. That was a, an experience on Saturday too, Joe, because I walked in there and I was getting ready to take a seat. And I sort of, I, my ears pricked up because I thought I heard something familiar. I was like, there's no way. There, there is no way. And I looked up the stairs and lo and behold, one of the great friends of uh, TCT been up there in the stands. That, that really caught me by surprise and it was awesome to be able to catch up with you. Yeah, it was great to catch up with you. And it was nice to see a lot of people that I've worked with and form relationships with uh, both players and parents of the players, as well as staff that I worked with at Parramatta. Uh, but nevertheless, it was it was excellent to catch up with with the, uh, you know, the Cumberland Throw guys and you two guys in particular. Excellent. <laughs> Mate, look, I've always known that you've arguably had the biggest heart of anyone that I've known in my life. And... You've got a, you've got that love for rugby league. You've got that love for coaching and coaching the coaches. You've had this great passion and love for the Parramatta Reels. And now you've still got room in that massive heart of yours to add in the Papua New Guinea, not only the bid, but of course the national team, because you've worked with the national team for a while. Uh, so I'm going to ask you first off, mate, How's life up in Papua New Guinea? Yeah, I, I don't know if I've got enough time to share this with you and Jono, um, 60s, but in a roundful way, um, it's probably the greatest decision that I've made. I'm a 50-year-old. I, I feel like I'm a young 50-year-old person. <laughs> that You act like it, that's was, for sure. You're, you're, you're a young man. Yes, yes. Yeah, I am. I am. And it's probably rekindled being over here. And look, let's understand that uh, living away from my wife and two kids is incredibly hard flying in for three weeks and flying back for one week. But it makes justice or it actually makes it a lot easier because of 
um, the passion and that, that's been rekindled inside me again for the love of sharing what I know and sharing what I've been privileged to work with previously because over here it's just another world. Not only the people, not only the culture, not only the terrain, but just the rugby league. It's incredible and everyone says it. You don't know what it's like until you've been in PNG to love rugby league. But I can't do it any justice. But being here for eight months, it's I, I can't explain it to you, um, 60s. John, oh, I can't explain it to you because it's like uh, me trying to explain to you what it's like to be a Queenslander, but I'm a New South Welshman. You can't physically feel it or understand it unless you're here for a period of time. But life in PNG is great. Um, it's the closest thing to being a rock star. Um, or a, um, uh, a a royal um, being involved in rugby league um, as you can possibly be, the um, the the the, um, the reach that you have, the uh, um, the I guess the the influence you have being involved in rugby league, but having come from an NRL program, people are just um, are beside themselves when. You're in their presence, and I don't see the big deal. I don't see that I'm a special person. I feel absolutely um, uh, privileged to be in this role. But life in PNG is great. I, I wake up every day, and I think I'm so lucky um, to be in a job that I'm so fortunate to be in and share something that I get paid to do with people that love it incredibly. You've uh, summed it up beautifully there, Joey. Uh, I suppose we'll give you a chance to play a bit of a tour guide for us now. Um, but have you discovered anything new that you've added to the Grima lifestyle, whether it's a culinary delight, local entertainment, a hobby or a pastime, a place to visit? Uh, what what has really gotten you smitten about your life up there in Port Moresby and, and PNG? There's three things that um, uh, politicians, in particular the Prime Minister James Marape, says about what makes PNG so unique. And the three things are faith, football, and top pizza. So I'm a, I'm a practising uh, Christian, so I, you know, I've already, you know, uh, um, I've got a relationship there. I'm involved in rugby league, and that's something that um, I hold dear and obviously got a relationship. But where I've really excelled is that I, um, I have a good understanding of the local language here in Tok Pitson because when you are coaching and talking to people, they understand Tok Pitson better or have a greater understanding than they do in English, although that's what they learn and taught um, um, through school in English. But so that's that's probably my claim to fame at the moment, that I have a pretty good um, um, understanding and I can speak and listen and understand uh, top pigeon um, quite well. But as far as being a tourist and so forth, um, I'm getting out and about a lot more. Outside Port Moresby, the terrain is unbelievable. So um, if you travel half an hour outside of Port Moresby, north, south, east or west, you are either in the ocean or you're in mountain ranges. So uh, I'm discovering that um, PNG is quite a large place, but majority of people um, in the area that I'm in reside in Port Moresby. However, I was very, very surprised to find out that over 80% of people live in jungle, regional or rural areas. So where I'm living at the moment in Port Moresby is only the tip of the iceberg. And you're going to tell us you haven't sampled any uh, culinary delights there, anything that's uh, food that is loved by the locals or you're, you're keeping to a, a traditional uh, Western diet, mate? I'm not that yet encouraged to try anything out of my comfort zone at this stage 60 so you're absolutely correct mate <laughs> well look you touched on it before 
Uh, talk to us about that passion for rugby league in Papua New Guinea. It's a really good question you ask, and it's um, um, it, it, rugby league over here, and why it's so passionate is because it provides the equal playing field for everyone else, whether they've got uh, boots, um, they've got um, uh, jerseys to play with. Um, it's that aggression, it's that passion, it's that uh, level um, where um, everyone's equal on the footy field. And when you go to a rugby league game, sometimes the, the, the lines aren't marked. And the only way you know where the footy field finishes and starts is by the um, number of people that are five and six deep who are the sideline. The collision, the excitement that the people that are, are watching receive are yelling and screaming and it's um, rebounding back onto the footy field which only drives the passion and the aggression and the excitement. Um, it's just ridiculous over here whether you're at a school game 60s whether you're at a you know a, 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 a representative game or a digital exxon mobile cup um first grade game it doesn't matter the support the excitement the aggression the passion is still the same and it's never what i've seen in australia before I guess it's because in it's the only country in the world where rugby league is actually the national sport. Yeah, it, it, yes, but it's more so. It's just it's in their DNA. They just are so um, captured by rugby league to the point where they would know more about players in the NRL than what some people in Australia that are involved in rugby league or support or go out and watch rugby league or their team each week, they would know more than what those people would. It's just, um, it's in their DNA. It's just, it's just who they are. It's part of their identity, their love for rugby league. And yes, that's why it is their national sport, 60s. And uh, you talk about that passion. We've seen in recent years, even with a, a lack of, Infrastructure, which is something that clearly you know has now been addressed, and we'll talk about that shortly. But we've seen in both you know the Prime Minister's thirteen uh, exhibition game, and then with the Junior Kumuls versus the Junior Kiwi, uh, Junior Aussies, or the Junior Roos, that they're they're delivering fantastic performances on the field, and that's driven largely, largely on the back of that passion. And and that, that's that's part thereof, um, um, the solution, but also the problem. What we need to establish, and that's uh, part of my remit and role within the whole framework of um, uh, rugby league or PNG um, or rugby league in PNG, is that um, we need to understand the game a little bit better. There's just more than passion. Use that passion. Drive with that passion. But the technical and the tactical and the discipline parts, if we can attach that to the passion, we're making the over uh, the 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 um, the product stronger, better, greater, particularly to give us um, um, long term longevity in the sustainability of rugby league over here at that senior or that elite level. So um, it's 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 there and we're tapping into it and um, it's something that's going to uh, be very, very um, interesting in, um, in, in, in the next couple of months. Give me a nice little uh, try, sis, for my next uh, question, actually, because you talked about the remit in which you're operating up there. Your role is at the heart. It's no doubt integral to the, the Papua New Guinea bid for an NRL licence in the coming years. So can you explain to everyone that's listening here what that entails and why it is so important for the bid and for the viability of rugby league up in Papua New Guinea? I'm employed over here by the uh, PNG NRL 18th team bid. So um, my remit or the majority of that is to create a sustainable pathway similar to what um, a lot of uh, NRL clubs have in New South Wales or Queensland. At the end of the day, we're trying to strive to be an NRL club identity and we want to have standards and structures and pathways similar to those 
elite NRL clubs in Australia. So last year, the NRL Beard Academy um, um, used a, a pilot program in Port Moresby, identifying the best 16 and under 18-year-old age groups from a competition called the Napa, um, from the National Capital District, which formulates about 20, uh, sorry, 59 schools that come together and they play competitions over a 16-week period. Over a four-week period, um, two squads of 35 players were identified, as I said, in the under-16s and under-18s. We offered over 12 weeks a um, skills-based talent program which honed their skills as well as assist them with the technical, the tactical and the disciplined areas around rugby league. Building on the back of that, what um, we've created now is that we're going to roll out the similar or a, uh, a similar skills-based program, but we're going to roll that out to six squads or five regional areas. So now we're taking the program that was piloted in Port Moresby and we're taking it to the highlands of Papua New Guinea, the um, lower part of the highlands in Garoka, the northern part of Papua New Guinea in Ley, the New Guinea Islands, um, which are off the, um, um, the uh, eastern side of Papua New Guinea. And then we've got two squads um, in the south which capture Port Moresby Central and Port Moresby City. And what we're also adding on to what we tested, uh, what we uh, trialled last year is that we're adding two more age groups. We're adding an under 15s and under 17s and an under 19s male program. But we're also um, adding on to an under 18s female program. So essentially, we're going to um, roll out this larger program in the six regions or the six squad areas in five regions of Papua New Guinea. Each squad or each area will have 120 young men or women, which collectively means that there's going to be 720 players in Papua New Guinea from all corners of the country that are going to receive the same ideology, coaching philosophies, training programs, the, the talking, the, um, the, the activities, the skills and drills. So the 15-year-old in Port Moresby is getting the same coaching as the under-18s female who's based in the New Guinea Islands is receiving. So now we're starting to come together and 720 young men and young women are going to be um, um, getting the one coaching philosophy, are going to be getting the same soft skills about nutrition, diet, hydration as everyone else it's in the program, that's in the program. So that's the, the, the task that we're um, um, looking forward to and will be rolled out on or around the 1st of April, which is in uh, less than a couple of weeks. Joey, that would have to be the largest unified, centralised coaching system in the history of the game, surely? Well, it's funny you say that because um, um, we've done some um, um, research and I can just tell you that uh, obviously at Parramatta because, uh, you know, I, I was there for such a period, long period of time, we were considered one of the largest elite and junior-based development programmed areas uh, and we only had 381 we're walking into we're going into a program um, rolling out a national framework strategy of 720 so um, it, it would have to be a major yeah it, it's one of the largest um, programs that you know I certainly am aware of um, but something that we're ready and we know where we're ready to go because we did a pilot area or we did a pilot program last year in POM. And um, we're confident of the staff that we've got uh, through the vetting process. 
And essentially what will happen is that my role is to mentor those coaches and the assistant coaches of those six areas and write the program and uh, work with those coaches to roll out uh, that program, but deliver it in their own style. Um, however, there will be some non-negotiables and um, um, specific um, things that they would need to roll out as part of the 20-week training program, Jono. Well, that must be uh, when we're when you're talking about uh, this, uh, the NRL bid, having such a, a vast elite pathways program that's essentially on a national level, it, that must put the PNG bid in good stead, having something like that there. I mean, there's obviously other aspects to the bid and other aspects that you wouldn't be involved in, but in terms of having that structure and framework for pathways into senior football, you know, you've got to be ticking a lot of boxes there. Yeah, and, and, and that's part of what uh, the CEO and I um, um, spoke about in, you know, um, identifying a dedicated coaching staff, having age-specific groups, having weekly sessions, specific um, position training and tailored coaching philosophies because the way that we would coach or roll out a program in PNG or deliver it would be different to how we would roll it out in um, um, Queensland or New South Wales or New Zealand or in England. Um, and to have that inclusive culture um, uh, of, you know, supporting a young female from the Highlands and, you know, young men and young women, um, that's the, the, the crux of what we're trying to do in um, um, putting this program together. And we're not just putting it together just to tick boxes. We want to put it together. And the challenge is we need to strive to be a Penrith Panther, a Parramatta Eel, a Brisbane Broncos. Although it's our first season going into it, the, um, um, the expectations are quite high. The resources that uh, we are, um, have purchased to, you know, um, to use in these programs, these academy programs, are of the standard of what we're used to in Australia. Um, so it goes without saying that we need this to be sustainable um, to be an NRL team or NRL club. But even even putting that aside, um, we need to do this to ensure that, you know, um, PNG or rugby league in PNG is moving forward uh, at the rate of what we want it to move. And Joey, regardless of the fate of the bid, and obviously we're looking for a positive result there and, and the PNG coming into the competition as the 18th NRL franchise, but regardless of the fate of the bid, you must be feeling uh, satisfied knowing that the work you're doing there is going to be critical to the advancement of the code and, and of rugby league in PNG regardless. Regardless, and um, uh, one of the things that uh, Andrew Hill, the CEO and, I, CEO and I have agreed to, that we need to find the next Justin Olam or Elsie Albert, and it's going to be increasingly hard if we don't have these programs and we don't have these, um, um, you know, these academies in place to assist the young men and young women of Papua New Guinea. So for us, it's a no-brainer and we know it works. So irrespective of where we are in 12 months, two years or three years, um, it's a, it's a non-negotiable in the processing of um, better athletes, particularly in rugby league, moving forward in PNG. Joey, I wanted to pose a question which is uh, getting your, maybe it's touching on your emotional side, um, but it's it's maybe it's a tough question from a match perspective. Going back in your link with PNG in the past, what has been the most exciting moment that you've experienced for the PNG national teams? Yeah, I, I think that's a real um, easy one at this stage. Now, given 90, 90 seconds away from being the first ever 
uh, PNG team to beat an Australian schoolboys team, I reckon that would have been the, the greatest highlight if it eventuated. However, we were 90 seconds away from that result. So therefore, I would have to say in 2019, when um, uh, I was part of um, the Kummels versus Great Britain test game here in Port Moresby, the fact that the English Roses played the uh, PNG Orchids in the previous game and a massive upset where the English Roses were beaten by the Orchids. Um, immediately after, um, it was Deja Vu. It was the uh, um, the Kummels that upset and beat um, the British Lions, which from a an outsider um not understanding because I was relatively new to PNG, seeing what that did to this country for a short period of time, that would have to be the most overwhelming, um, you know, situation that I've been a part of or witnessed um, whilst being in a PNG. Joey, Knowing you as we know you, and I feel like anyone that knows you from both a personal and a rugby league perspective would agree with us, you wouldn't have taken this appointment if you didn't believe in the dream of the Papua New Guinea uh, country getting a franchise in the NRL as the 18th team. So there's no doubt you're confident about the strength of the bid coming from PNG, and you believe it's going to be successful. So from your personal perspective, why do you think that the PNG team should be the next NRL franchise? Well... To answer the first part, having left a club that I loved for such a long period of time, the decision to come over here wasn't as hard as what people may s suggest or think it was. Um, this job um, allowed me to rekindle my love for rugby league again. Not that it was fractured or broken, but... Sometimes you just get a little bit comfortable and disillusioned sometimes when you're in a, a role for a long period of time. And when the opportunity came about, I really liked where the direction from the PNG RFL were heading. And I really enjoyed from where the NRL bid CEO, Andrew Hill, was coming from. He had a, a lot of experience in the senior roles of NRL. He's got a lot of experience in international rugby league. So I was not only backing the horse, I was actually backing the jockey as well. There are some things that I can't share with you um, about the NRL bid and, you know, the dealings around that um, for sensitive reasons. However, from a personal heart feeling reason PNG if this development pathway will work and it's only a matter of time until we roll out a pathway a production line of players who are destined for more elite competitions, in particular NRL and NRLW. We already know the passion and the drive they have for rugby league. We have over um, 4 million people that we believe that are registered playing rugby league in PNG. And it's only fair that the people here in PNG have their own club and have their own NRL team, both men and women, to aspire to play to or to play for. And and no doubt um, when you've got locals that are aspiring to play and make it through to their own team, the support for that team is going to be phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. You can see it with the PNG Heritage players playing in the NRL now um, via social media and marketing and sponsor sponsorship opportunities in PNG. Um, 
that's going to create so much more than just the game of rugby league in Papua New Guinea. Well, Joey, we know that you've got that passion for what you're achieving over there in Papua New Guinea, and that's going to be driving the bid towards success. But you still can't take some of that blue and gold out of your blood. So I want to ask you, because you've had a bit to do with this young player, the selection of Blaze Talungi to make his NRL debut this week, you must that must give you a special feeling. When um, my son actually, you talk about uh, blue and gold, tragic. Uh, my son, Frank, is actually a, a, a bigger tragic uh, for Parramatta than what <laughs> I am, if that's possible. But he rang me up and said, Dad, do you know this guy called Blaze? And I said, yes, mate, I do. And the fact that I was talking about my son, um, about uh, a young man who's come up through the junior grades and having worked with uh, Blaze um, for four or five years in the Jets program, the junior programs or the junior elite path programs, um, it was very, very overwhelming. And um, um, I couldn't be any more proud of the whole um, of Blaze and his whole family. He's got a wonderful um, um, mum and dad and, and brother and, and um, siblings and so forth and couldn't have been um, – no one deserves it more than Blaze, uh, given his versatility and he probably – you know, um, uh, he, he was changed from his preferred position – last year from 5'8 to centre to compensate for some talented programs and what was the best fit for the team. And ironically, it's been that change for moving him to 5'8 uh, or from 5'8 to the centres that has established his um, start in the NRL. But um, very overwhelming, very proud, and it's just another example of um, good things happening to good people. Well, Joey, we don't need a reason to enjoy a chat with you when it comes to rugby league or life in general, but to have you share your insight on how the PNG beard is going and how your development of their junior pathways is progressing is an incredible little bit of insight for us. So thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule. I, I know you are flat out up there um, and having a chat with us on the tip sheet, mate. It is an absolute blast. Well, it's I'm I'm, I'm crazy honoured. Um, I'm really, really crazy honoured to be um, on your show again. Um, I loved it. I look forward to our segment um, previously last year talking about the junior reps, because whilst I'm talking about rugby league, I'm talking from the heart and what you guys do for rugby league. In this case, I'm looking out for me and you know trying to drive what. Um, building up some more profile for uh, rugby league in PNG. I just thank you guys, uh, 60s and Jono. Um, he's a great friend. It was really nice to see you last week. And I, I, I just hope you and your listeners can get support or can support the PNG bid. Jump onto our social medias, um, give us a like or do what people do. I don't have social media, so I don't know what people do, but jump on there and have a look and um, really honoured to be here again with you guys. And who knows, maybe when we are, um, when we are the 18th team, let's uh, do a, a recap of where we were, where we've come and where we're heading to uh, when we are that 18th, 18th team. Mate, you might even be able to host us in your penthouse <laughs> here in Port Moresby. Well, I said to you, 60s, if you come over, I'll host you and Jono. I tell you what, you will love it over here. So I'd encourage you guys to save your money, get a visa, get a plane ticket. I'll do the rest. <laughs> Too good, mate. Too Thanks, good. mate. It's been, it's been great to chat, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Love you guys, and uh, um, best of luck, and all the best to your listeners. You're doing a great job, guys. Thanks, Joey. Thanks indeed, 60s. Yeah, what a wonderful chat to a truly wonderful man. Mate, if there's anyone that could possibly be taking that PNG pathways system to what it needs to be for an NRL bid or, or what it needs to be and more, 
it's going to be Joey Grimer, the passion that he has for rugby league. And as I said, not just the game itself, but um, coaching young players, coaching the coaches of young players and just setting up systems. You know, he's the, the PNG were onto a winner when they managed to secure Joey Grimer in setting up their pathways. And obviously, he's a great friend of ours and it's always a delight to speak to him, whether it's a conversation that we're having as part of the po- podcast or, you know, just catching up with him um, at the footy or or at his place or wherever the case may be. He's, uh, as I said, he's a great mate of ours and um, we were really pleased to be able to share that information that he basically broke today in terms of that massive, massive undertaking that's about to be launched in April. I'll tell you what, 60s, Joey was already the, the man that was perhaps the singularly most unbridled, enthusiastic rugby league identity that we knew. To think that his passion for the game has been rekindled beyond that level is almost scary. I mean... Oh, <laughs> I, I, can, I can only imagine, right, if he's being blown away by the way people respond to him over there and he and he did speak to us a, a, a little bit more colourfully about um, what it's like to um, be, uh, you know, just at, at rugby league matches or down the markets or whatever the case may be because of of the role that he has in PNG, um, you know, if if he's blown away by that reaction there, we've seen him in action at junior reps or at the at the NRL, and he can't get he can't walk a short distance without people stopping him in in Sydney in Parramatta, uh, stopping him to have a chat and. Um, you know, everyone seems to know Joey. When you go to the football, you can't expect to grab five minutes alone with him normally because he's, you know, in a conversation because next thing, every couple of minutes, there's someone come comes along who knows Joey and wants to stop for a chat. So yeah, he's always yeah. been a man in demand. And, um, and so, gen- so generous of his time to everyone as well. Oh, so. yeah, absolutely. So you can imagine what it must be like in in Papua New Guinea if he's saying that he's never experienced anything <laughs> like it before. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed that uh, really fascinating insight into how PNG is travelling as they develop those uh, pathways, the lifeblood of their game for that bid as the 18th NRL franchise. And we really look forward to seeing how it all manifests come, I think, is it 2028 or 2026 that the new bid's going to be put in? Uh, whichever year it is, really can see how it plays out for PNG. And obviously, we'll keep up to date with Joey Every step of the way. Um, until then, though, uh, quick shout out to our sponsors for this show: Big Swing Golf North Mead and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn Rowan and Parramatta. And we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Sixties, um, not a Parramatta podcast per se, but I think we can still sign off uh, in a fitting manner. Of course, we can. Go, you mighty eels. <laughs>